Now, um, I want to tell you a bit about this report which was published in September last year and is a report of the Academy of Medical Sciences, as um, Paul has said. And this, the, the idea to do this report came from the President of the Academy, uh, Sir, Sir John Took. And the Academy of Medical Sciences, as many of you know, is um, an organisation which considers particularly research into biomedicine, non-clinical, clinical, and has a large body of fellows who uh, consider a number of areas. And it really hasn't done all that much, I think, until this report on uh, health of the public research. Uh, and it was very important uh, when we defined the terms of reference to decide what it was we wanted to do. And what we were asked to do was really to think about what is the research capability we need in the UK to address the coming challenges to our health. And if you think about it, although we said the health of the public by 2040, if you think about the people who will be sitting in this room or a similar room by 2040 and who will be the leaders of tomorrow, they are in our universities today. So it is incumbent upon us to prepare not only in what we do in our daily work, but to think of the next generation of people who should be producing evidence for the future. So we did some futures thinking about exploring the health challenges of the UK population. We developed a vision for health of the public of the UK population by 2040. But the prime focus of this report is not so much on the, um, on the, on the service, but on the research which we need to underpin interventions and, the, and the, the skilled workforce we need to do that. But critically, and that's why it's so important to me to have the opportunity to speak to you today, is that you are all, who, you all, many of you do research, but you also do it very much in a policy-driven and, uh, and practice-driven environment, and that is so important. Because a major criticism of so many scientists is we sit in our ivory towers and we don't engage with the real world. And when we collected evidence for this report, it was very striking that many of the people in the local authorities and in PHE said, well, we all, enjoy, we all would love to have more time to do more research. Evidence is very important to us, but academics often ask the wrong questions about the wrong things, produce answers in the wrong time frame that are too slow for us. Where the academics are saying, we need the rigour we need the long-term time frame. We need to give you definitive answers. And somewhere, we all have to meet in the middle. It's been my privilege to, be as, as, to work with PHE for my entire career. And in fact, without that collab, well, in its, in its previous transmogrifications. And I think without those sort of links, a lot of the work that I've been involved in wouldn't have been um, used for, for example, service provision for HIV, for the annual projections you produce, for uh, developing, for example, some of the screening programmes, HPV vaccination, chlamydia control. All the evidence, uh, some of the evidence that has gone to form those programmes came from the research we've done, not, um, not just alone at UCL, but actually very often with colleagues at PHE, and that's been fantastically important. So a major focus of the report is the issue about developing much better links between evidence, policy development, service delivery, in which there are specific recommendations about PHE. And in a way, my plea to you um, is that we, I hope we can all engage in some of the ideas in the report which have been collectively produced. What is really striking is Paul mentioned reports that did affect change. There are many, many more collecting dust on library shelves. So when I finished doing this report, I, it was a lot of work. I thought, great, that's done. And I thought, no, it isn't done. This is just the beginning. There's no point in producing these things unless actions follow from them, assuming people agree with the conclusions. I wanted just to put up the names of the working group members to, you will see this is not public health, it's health of the public. And we use that term because millions of people contribute to the health of the public. And many of the things which determine our health lie well outside the health service, well outside the public health service. They include our environments, which they include the taxes we pay, they include the, the houses we live in, the education we receive. And for that reason, the members of the working group came from a very broad areas of disciplines, obviously public health, psychology, clinical medicine, but also the environment, economics um, and uh, psychology and a number of other areas. We saw as our primary um, aspiration for 2040 
was to have substantial improvements in both mental and physical health, and of course key to this, the reduction in inequality, something we often write about but don't know very much about what to do about because inequalities persist, although life expectancy and overall um, quality of life uh, probably improves, the, the, the variations between us don't. And we set some supporting ambitions, you can see those there on the slides, about um, an environment which uh, looks after, that supports healthy living. So it's not just about changing behaviour, it's about changing environments in which people are engaged and empowered and in which, um, whereas a society we very often value economic outcomes, we felt the values of society must also see health and health equity as a major indicator of success. There is a big debate going on about the sustainability of the NHS and you'll hear that almost every morning. There is a, a review going on in the House of the Lords, a, 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 a select committee on the sustainability of the NHS where I know a number of people have given evidence from PHE, I believe. And all of them have raised the very important issue that the future of our health and our health services depends on a sustainable health service and a sustainable environment. Um, but it also uh, depends critically on on, on thinking about prevention and not simply about treatment services and about the changing demography of our population. And that means not just sustainability but resilience. And you as a national body have a critical part, as you well know, in contributing to health security and global health security. We do not act on our own, um, despite some of the political uh, environments we're currently faced with. To do all those things we do need the right research capacity and infrastructure and that is the focus of the report's recommendation. I just want to re remind you about views about prevention which actually are in the Wanderlust report mentioned by Paul and in the NHS five-year review. These are the kinds of words one will see in these reports repeatedly. That we need a radical upgrade in prevention and public health and hard-hitting national action. Now we say that, but strangely enough, we don't do it. We have now the opportunity of the sustainability and transformation plans, which I think um, we still don't know quite what effect they're having, but hopefully they will bring together the approach of thinking about health, not only in a treatment context, but in a prevention context, of bringing health and social services more closely together. But we have to go beyond simply health and social services to the, the broader determinants of health. So that's what the rubric says, radical upgrade in prevention and public health. Why? Because prevention is a major role, as you know, in, reduce, in, in reducing illness. Here are the four in ten cancers that can be prevented by um, changes to, to it, reductions in smoking, improved diet, um, and alcohol re reduction, but we all know, you all know, that there are major social inequalities and exposure and outcomes, and that these are, these, are, these are driven not just by individual behaviours, but the area of research we find most difficult and most contention, contentious, which is often in the environmental, fiscal and legislative environment, which often creates, of course, the most difficult issues around policy and politics. So interestingly, you may also be aware that um, in the same month that we published our report, there was a House Health, Health Committee public health report post uh, which looked at the effects on, on public health following the legislative changes post-2013 and the move of the public health service into the local authorities. I know that's something which um, your environment you're all working in and it has... In, 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 at least potentially some major advantages but in reality as you know there have been major cuts to public health budgets which the report says was a false economy as they add to the future costs of health and social care and risk widening health inequalities so we're in interesting times in public health you are um, all leaders in the field and I think we have to really think very carefully about how we build um, a, a, a health of the public or public health perspective into the future, um, uh, uh, the futures of, of the public's health in Britain. Now, if you think about um, the uh, discussion that goes on along around clinical medicine, you will often hear the term precision medicine, um, and indeed the term four P's medicine, which is providing clinical practice which is predictive, preemptive, 
um, uh, uh, personalised and participatory. It's very difficult for me now to remember four things. Um, three is the limit, but I've remembered them all, so that feels the tangles in my brain don't seem so bad today. Um, but in terms of precision medicine, a lot of the discussion about precision medicine is around the development of genomic medicine. But of course, the things that determine our health are only partly our, our genes, they're also our environment, our choices, our behaviours and our lifelong experience. So alongside the notion of precision medicine, we need also to be thinking about personalised prevention or precision prevention as well, because uh, um, we cannot, we have to look at, the, at the, the whole person and the ways in which we can prevent disease occurring in the first place. And of course the one thing you cannot intervene in is the genetic material you're born with. Well you can, you can intervene of course through epigenetics, but basically our genes are what we've got. And therefore that in a way makes the personalised prevention uh, around aware of what people's risks are, which we can get from a range of information and look at competing risks, we have to intervene in all those competing risks. Which means that while on the one hand we have to deal with the environmental determinants of health, we also need to bring a health of the public perspective into clinical practice and see greater alignment of prevention in clinical practice as well as in integrating public health interventions across the systems. And that's quite a challenge. I think we should not see clinical medicine and public health as separate. We need, if anything, to bring them together in order that we can try and um, reduce the burden on the NHS, but also improve people's lives. So although there has been increased investment in health of public research in the UK over the last decade, there's an awful lot that we don't know about the interlinking factors that determine health. A lot of that comes from epidemiology. And even more difficult is how to solve things at a population level. And the number of, the, the, a lot of the prevention research we do is at an individual clinical level, not at a population level. So we made a number of recommendations. The first is that we need to optimise research um, it to improve the health of the public and very often that means bringing together a broad range of disciplines. Uh, some of you may be involved for example in an EPSRC, that's the um, Engineering Research Council funded project um, uh, which is based at UCL but there are people at PHE involved in that, which is looking at remote diagnostics for infectious diseases. But rather than simply looking at the if you like the technology, we're also looking at the pathways from using that technology to use it in clinical practice, but then also to use it for public health, for example, for the early detection of, of infections. Now that collaboration involves engineers, computer scientists, environmental scientists, public health people and so on. And it's that kind of transdisciplinary research which we want to see um, and that research needs to be uh, looking at evaluating change across populations. Very often those sort of transdisciplinary research can't use the methods that come from clinical practice. Um, for example, if you want to measure the impact of a natural experiment like uh, uh, the ban of smoking in public places, you can't do that by a randomised controlled trial. You've got to use very different kind of methods and for that you need the right kind of data. Now we talk a lot about prevention but I'll remind you that the spend on prevention in terms of research is somewhere now about 5% of the budget in that second, second box so we have in fact more or less doubled the spend on prevention in the last decade, prevention research, but um, it's still a very small proportion of the budget and we spend about 5% of the health spend also on prevention. So we spend a very small fraction of our resources on this area despite what we um, say about it. So we uh, recommended that in a situation where a lot of the, the prevention research th there is relatively little done and where it is done it's often individually focused and this was, this was certainly commented on in a review of the National Prevention Research Initiative. It had made progress but it, 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 it was focused on individual interventions and that a lot of people um, were kind of looking at this whole issue of, of a lot, many of the funders were looking at how best to deliver population health research at scale requires very often big investments. I mean the kind of investments we're beginning to see for example in informatics, 
in cohorts, in, um, for example, a, a, the research we need around obesity or dementia. It requires transdisciplinary research. Um, and so we recommended the creation of a UK strategic coordinating body for the health of the public, health of public research, or SCOPA. That received a lot of um, uh, uh, support from the research community, and we are in discussions with the Office of Strategic Coordination of Health Research, which in a sense coordinates clinical research, primarily clinical research, between MR, Medical Research Council and NIHR, to think about how we can bring the funders together to think about some of the big questions and the big research approaches we need to be using for health of the public, by not by funding per se, although there will be a body of funders, but to provide strategic direction to coordinate between the many stakeholders beyond the traditional biomedical sphere, like the engineers, like the environmental sciences, scientists, to really think about the big questions in, in population health. So we are looking now, hopefully, to implementation of that, and but that is currently a, a work in progress. The second thing, and I think dear to your hearts here, is harnessing the digital revolution. Um, there are still enormous questions in the, about the use of data. Uh, first of all, the, the tremendous power of data, and yet, of course, the health service remains one of the few undigitized technologies that we need to, to move forward. It raises uh, all sorts of questions, as you know, about ethics, regulation and governance. But, of course, those are issues that relate not just to things like health records, um, but also to all the data we are constantly creating around us and you will have created um, unwittingly or, uh, you know, on your walk up here this morning as you, somebody's counting your steps and knows where you are and um, all the data we are uploading through our digital phenotypes, the searches we make on the internet, the emails we send, all these things um, are stored and kept forever um, and people worry actually much more about the health data than they do about some of the public data they use. But that is a very important issue to be discussed with the, with, the, with the public. But once you get beyond ethics and governance, there's tremendous power in these data. Because if we knew more about our, the competing risks that contribute to our health, that would be important for our clinical care. It would be important for the way we evaluate the health services. It would be important for understanding the wider drivers um, beyond the health services, education, environment, air quality, that would in turn, all put together, enable us to make much better decisions and better evaluate what we are achieving collectively um, and how best to use our resources. So we uh, made a number of recommendations about um, how we should be capitalising on data. There has been a lot of money uh, through the FAR, um, Institute uh, and through the Turin Institute, which will see a huge investment in, um, in the digital revolution. But many of you will have heard the government's ambition to have many million more people who are digitally, um, digital experts, if you like, to work in the digital economy. And health is extraordinarily important in that, in that space, and we need the next generation of people. If you talk to people working in the FAR, the biggest one of the biggest shortages is that they don't have, if you like, the, the, the expert people who can come to work on the data, interpret the data, ask questions of it. And, and we need really to be working now to encourage people from school days onwards to, uh, uh, to start working in the digital space, be that uh, the analysis of data, be that uh, the curation of data, be that asking questions of the data, uh, or indeed beginning to deliver health services digitally and remotely, um, which is a huge uh, opportunity going forward. I often uh, ask you to think, last time you felt um, a bit unwell, many of us no longer um, necessarily phone a friend or phone the NHS or phone the doctor, we, we go on Google. And basically the Medical textbooks, which when I studied medicine were only available to, to me or to the medical students, we all have the textbook now. Everybody has a textbook. It's available online. And that has tremendous, uh, could, could fundamentally changed the relationship we have with our health professionals because they become, if you like, interpreters of data for us. They themselves use those data 
The world is changing in the way we make diagnoses. We're seeing machine learning. We're seeing um, robotics. We're seeing a whole range of things which fundamentally change the future of health. And we need to be ready for that and making the most of it, not falling in too many, too many traps about um, governance and, and, and ethics, but actually using that to enable our, our improved health going forward. And I think there's a great deal to do in that space. To do that, we need a new generation of researchers and practitioners. Um, and again, we, put, we give uh, recommendations about that. And therefore, we think there should be a, a new generation of researchers who work in a different way, not in a siloed way, but across disciplines. And again, the Academy has written um, a report about team science. Currently, the way we do science is often around you know, one head of a lab and a bunch of people in their lab. This is about taking forward teams of people, not necessarily working in single disciplines, but working together. And I see that much more with, with younger researchers. They're much more familiar with the idea of working in multidisciplinary teams. To do that, there are many areas where people want to learn about health. UCL, I work closely with our, our Department of Architecture, for example, our School of Architecture, around um, a number of aspects of environment and health. We also felt, we also recommended that there should be more joint undergraduate and postgraduate models, uh, modules looking at uh, between health population, health and other di disciplines. You can think of that in statistics. We, ha we now have an undergraduate BSc in population health, for example, at UCL. Um, and uh, we need to think very much about how we learn about one's other topics. That includes people in health learning, for example, about environmental science. The second thing is practitioner training. Um, my, in my office, I very, very frequently see people who have got very interested in epidemiology or public health, but don't necessarily, they're often doctors, they don't want to be public health practitioners. They want to be really good cardiologists who see the broader ways in which they can contribute to reduction of cardiovascular disease in the population and not just in their patients. And those people need access to the skills that for us are bread and butter as part of our training. So we are now working between the Faculty of Public Health and the College of Physicians to develop new training programmes and credentialing, not just for um, medics, but also for, for non-medics who are training in, in, in some of these areas. And so we are hoping to uh, upskill um, a range of different groups in the sciences which underpin uh, population health. Some of the medical schools in Scotland have already got major informatics training uh, in, as, as part of every medical student's training um, so that they can really become uh, adept in those areas. Improving health equity is a real problem um, uh, and uh, for that we need all sectors of society to work together. But it was in this space that we felt there was a much uh, greater convergence needed between clinical and health of, of the public approaches um, so that when we are, we are not just always dealing with end stage disease, but actually we ensure equitable access to uh, prevention initiatives as well as to health services. Finally, we talked about working together, and this is where PHE becomes very important. There was a specific recommendation in the report about Public Health England working with Health Education England and the devolved equivalents to develop regional hubs of engagement. Now, the idea behind this is that uh, I think through the HPRUs that you've got, and many of you from the HPRUs here, are already a very good example of the way that of what that working might be, although that's currently only in infectious diseases, is that there should be regional hubs of engagement between practitioners and researchers. We've done a lot of this in clinical care through the AHSCs, the Academic Health Sciences Centres, links between the universities and clinicians. I think those links are much less strong between those in public health um, and those in public health research. Uh, and I think that's, in a way, made more, if anything, more difficult by, um, uh, it, it, by moving to local authorities where those sort of, those sort of arrangements are, are much less well developed because the NHS has always had quite good links with the universities. That's much less, less the case for local authorities. So this is a challenge really to Public Health England uh, to think about your regional networks, 
your regional links and how we can work together to improve engagement between practitioners and researchers in the same way as being done for clinical care. And so we recommending, re recommended the formation of these and there was strong support for these hubs at the Academy of Medical Sciences implementation workshop in January at which a number of people from PHE were present and the feeling was that we needed to build on existing models of good practice of which there are now a number to create a, a regional wide network of, of uh, regional hubs of engagement probably linked um, into very much the digital capability to understand more about our health at not just at individual level but at population level. Um, with regard to health and health equity I've already said that much that drives health lies outside the Department of Health um, and therefore one of our recommendations was that there should be more engagement um, of uh, or more health expertise in government in, in departments outside of the Department of Health and one of our recommendations was to create Health of the Pu Public Policy Fellows. Some of you may have been into the Chief Medical Officer's Office where I, uh, Chief Medical Officer's Office where there are I know fellowships offered for people in public health training which is a really good exposure to government and policy but we felt this sort of model could work across other departments in in, in government and one of the major funders is looking to fund uh, such a scheme. We wanted also to consider the very difficult area of academic and commercial sector collaboration. Much more work and guidance has been developed for this in the pharmaceutical industry. But as you well know, there are all sorts of difficult issues around um, engaging with commercial enterprises, but I mean, typically in the area of alcohol, for example, but also with the food industry. We said, in a sense, that the way that, that um, supermarkets work can, of course, improve the health of the public, but it can go the other way. And how we work with industry is something that we feel we need, need to look at mechanisms and, and guidelines for how to do, to do joint working. And finally, how do we, we talk about co-production with the public? I don't think we do it all that much. And now you can see with citizen science, science and the increasing engagement of people with their health is how we can develop um, better methods of engagement which use the power uh, and the sense of people's, the public's interest in, in their health but how we do it in a way that um, increases he health equity uh, and, and doesn't in fact widen inequalities for example through the digital divide. Uh, I hope some of you, I don't ask you to read the whole report, it's quite long, but um, you can get it online and if you're really interested there are copies of the Academy of Medical Sciences in, um, in hard copy which um, I do like people to leave lying around in the hope somebody will dip into them. Thank you very much. <laughs>